Okay, the witnesses in opposition should make their way to the dais or the table. Mr. Chair, yeah. Mr. Chair, members, Randy Perry with Aaron Reed and Associates on behalf of PORAC and the California Association of Highway Patrol. We're in opposition to the bill. First of all, just, I want to, want to start off just by making it very clear to everyone that both PORAC and the Association of Highway Patrol were among the earliest supporters of the use of body cams in the United States. Uh, we, when we came out publicly uh, thinking that the idea would uh, promote transparency and trust. Uh, we actually received, you know, some emails and letters from other states and agencies in other states kind of asking what we were doing. I can tell you that we agree with a lot of the statements of the people who testified in support of this bill as to the, pos the uh, positive use of body cams. However, uh, having said that, we believe that this bill, the way it is drafted, is a disincentive for agencies to continue the programs they have started or to begin the programs that they are currently possibly negotiating and meet and confer process with the rank and file to start the system. The liability just alone on the idea that an officer cannot review their own video from their body cam prior to writing a report takes away the, the accuracy that this new, this, this, this recent um, technology would allow for and take us to the next step of accuracy in writing reports. Currently, officers can watch their in-car video cameras, which capture everything, including audio, because they have a microphone right here. The High Patrol has been using that for years, as has most agencies. They can use audio tapes. They can use review video from ATMs across the street, um, and all, including their field notes, all prior to writing their reports. Almost all of the major agencies who are now using body cams or in the process of beginning that program have negotiated with, with their employees and allow the, the review of those cameras. This bill would set back all of those agencies to go back to the drawing board in the meet and confer process and designing their own policies and procedures to do that. Also, the U.S. Attorney General, Eric Holder, has recommended that officers be able to review this, this video prior to writing the reports. Accuracy is the most important part of a, of a fair judicial system, all the way because the district attorney takes those reports with the video and makes the determination on what to file, who to file against, whether or not to file, because maybe the video showed that it, it wasn't what the officers uh, had initially thought or what somebody else had filmed on their telephone. Um, so our, our opposition remains to uh, remains uh, our opposition to the bill remains on that that, that major section that says that uh, officers cannot review the camera ahead of time. Um, finally, and we've testified to this before, it is Porak's position, and Porak has testified to it that if this bill were to pass and become law as it is we would go to our agency heads who are wishing to implement a body cam program and we would likely oppose it based on the liability of the agency that this would place them in, the liability of the city and county, but from our point of view, the liability on the officer both to potentially be disciplined if they have uh, some discrepancies in their initial report, which by the way, keep in mind, Many of these types of incidents that are now narrowed down to in this, in this bill happen in seconds, in moments, many times in moments of terror where there are people, we don't know who's shooting, who threw the rocks, who did whatever the, the incident is that would qualify under this bill happen in instance. 
for an officer to try and have to go back, recall that, look at their video afterwards, then amend their original document, which both of those reports would be admissible in court, would absolutely set that officer and agency up for liability. And if it occurs where that video is thrown out, inadmissible, or the cases are thrown out, that officer will be part of the Brady, on a Brady list and will be of no use to that agency if they can no longer testify on their own cases and will be fired. That's what will happen if this passes as is. We fully support body cams. We've been working with the author to try and implement this, and we want everyone in California, every agency, to take a look at implementing body camera. Thank you. Next witness. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Tim Yarian representing the Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, the Los Angeles Police Protective League, the Los Angeles Deputy Probation Officers Union, AFSCME Local 685, the Riverside Sheriffs Association. Um, I would echo Mr. Perry's comments. Um, um, in, 19, in 2014, the United States Department of Justice considered the issue of body, body cams and did a report uh, on the issue of body cams uh, considering the views of all the departments, all the chiefs and sheriffs, rank and file organizations throughout the country. The statements of the provisions in Ms. Weber's bill do not reflect that report. They're inconsistent with that report. Um, they, re they, they reflect the Oakland Police Department's policy, but that is the minority view, not the majority view. The requirements of AB 66, as set forth in the U.S. Department of Justice report, examine this specific issue of police review of body cameras prior to uh, writing a report. In their recommendation number 20, they state, officers should be permitted to review video footage of an incident in which they were involved prior to making a statement about the incident. And they gave the following rationale. Reviewing footage will help officers remember the incident more clearly, which leads to more accurate documentation of events. The goal, members, is to find the truth, which is facilitated by letting officers have all possible evidence of the event. Now, Ms. Weber's bill does not allow us to do that in the most serious cases. And this is exactly and precisely when officers need to have that review in an incident that involves a serious use of force. As the chief from Oakland stated, this is when things get very blurry. Things happen very quickly. It's very difficult for officers to comprehend what's going on. And so it's essential that they're able to monitor these videos. If they're not able to, the report from the Justice Department goes on to state, if a jury or administrative review body sees that the report says one thing and the video indicates another, this will create inconsistencies in the evidence that will damage a case or unfairly undermine the officer's credibility. That's what this is all about. When an officer is brought before an administrative tribunal, if they're brought to court, defense counsel, plaintiff's attorneys are going to use every inconsistency they can find to impeach the officer. This opens the door to liability against the department, liability against the officer, and ultimately li liability against the municipality. Um, one other point, too, uh, that I'd like to make. Um, the author purports to say that we've addressed the issues of Meyer Millius Brown in this, and that's absolutely an inaccurate statement. Members of the Los Angeles delegation will know that one of my clients, the Los Angeles Police Protective League, recently have been working for over a year, recently reached an agreement with the Los Angeles Police Department and Chief Beck, and we're implementing Recommendation 20 like the majority of police departments throughout the state of California and the country. Now, what this bill would do would be completely to undermine that agreement because it has a different standard of review than what the League and the Department have agreed to. 
This not only undermines local control, it undermines the express provisions of the Myers-Millius-Brown Act, which say this is a working condition that should be negotiated at the local level. So not only does it prejudice the officer, it undermines uh, uh, the Myers-Millius-Brown Act and takes away local control. Um, I could go on about some of the other provisions in the bill, but I think that we made our point. We oppose this bill, um, and I do want to commend the author, though. She is working with us, and we'll continue to work with her um, if this bill was on committee. Thank you. So good morning to Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee. Jerry Williams, uh, Oxnard Police Chief, as well as a member and a board member of the California Police Chiefs Association. So we oppose this bill as written. There are a number of provisions that have automatically been articulated to you from the standpoint of the officer being able to review that video prior to making a statement. And I can appreciate what uh, Chief Went mentioned about the successes of his program. However, the Rialto Police Department has implemented and has body-worn cameras, and what they do is they allow their officers to upload, the, upload, upload that information first and then provide a statement. So that takes away the opportunity for the officer or the perception that something could be taken away from it. The prescriptive nature of this bill as written could have unintended consequences of not allowing or not wanting agencies to now adopt body-worn camera systems. And quite frankly, the California Police Chiefs Association, we are strong supporters of that because we know that those cameras have the tendency to build trust, to increase transparency in law enforcement, as well as to obtain valuable evidence. There are, is another provision in the bill that would prohibit officers from recording in health facilities. That prohibition is problematic in the event we have an active shooter situation or in some other type of crime going on. That discretion should be made by the chief of police and or by that officer at the time. There is one more issue that we have as well um, in this bill, and that's the prohibition of an officer uh, being able to record a subject who is a victim of violence or sexual abuse or domestic violence. We do believe that that officer should have the discretion and that if the videotaping of that encounter is problematic for that victim, he or she should have that opportunity and that discretion and not have it be absolutely prescribed by the letter of this bill. So we are in favor of promoting the responsible use of body-worn cameras, but we don't want an overreaching one-size-fits-all black and white system. We do want to allow the police chiefs and or the leaders of their associations to be able to make some of those decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to public comment and opposition. Public comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, John Lovell, and I'm here on behalf of the California College and University Police Chiefs Association. It's an organization that embraces the concept of body-worn cameras. Ironically, under California law, even if all of this would be enacted, they wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, to do that. But that's a separate issue. But one of the things we do want to mention is, is that this bill does not mention privacy issues. And to suggest that, all right, we're going to do this in another bill. No, the better way to do this is to recognize that this issue, including privacy, is a seamless garment. How are we going to protect the interests of a confidential informant? Someone who lives in an area where they feel extraordinarily intimidated. They're willing to talk to the officer, but darn it, you know, don't put this image up on the cloud because we know nobody ever hacks anything. Uh, these are issues that must be addressed within the four corners of a single bill, not stretched out among a multiplicity of bills. Thank you. Morning, I'm uh, Mark Helms. I'm the uh, police chief in the city of Lodi. I'm also a former deputy police chief in the city of Stockton. Uh, and I also serve on the board of directors of the California Police Chiefs Association. Uh, you've heard from Chief Williams uh, that uh, California chiefs oppose this bill in its current state. I will tell you that Chief Williams is a recognized authority among our peers for her research on this topic. She knows it. She knows what she's talking about. Um, the issue of at the time of the statements that are given by an officer is very problematic for us. Um, speaking from experience, any discrepancy that comes up in an officer-involved shooting investigation is torn apart in federal court. This is a recipe for those discrepancies. So once again, uh, 
very much in opposition uh, in the, to the bill in its current state. Thank you. This is public comment in opposition. Please just state your name, your affiliation, and uh, your opinion on the bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my name is Bob Lehner. I am on the uh, board of the California Police Chiefs Association. I'm a 38-year police officer of three different states, command officer, including assistant police chief in Tucson, Arizona, chief of police in Eugene, Oregon, and presently chief of police in Elk Grove, California. Um, I come with a, a pretty fair amount of experience in the field across several uh, different types of jurisdictions. Uh, we and I am opposed. Let me say one other thing first. For the record, as most of my peers, I am a strong supporter of body cameras on the part of police officers. We are in the process of implementing one right now in Elk Grove. I am, along with the, my peers, uh, strongly opposed to this particular bill. Uh, like many others, I don't need to go into all of the reasons because many of them have been stated, but our agency is one that if this bill becomes law as written, we probably will not be able to implement the body camera program we'd planned on. I think that position is probably shared by most of the agencies in the state who have not yet implemented body cameras. So uh, uh, we're in opposition. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Member Shane Levine on behalf of the California Statewide Law Enforcement Association and the Orange County Deputy Sheriff's Association. Uh, appreciate the author and her staff working with us, but for the reasons already stated, we are in opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Sir Craig Carter, asking a police chief uh, with about 100 cameras already deployed and opposed. Mr. Chair, Member Sean Rundle with the California Peace Officers Association and Association of Law Enforcement uh, Statewide, also in opposition. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Corey Salzello on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association in opposition. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Carley, Chief of Police in Vacaville, California. We've implemented body-worn cameras for over six years, very familiar with technology and where we're going with this. A one-size-fits-all approach does not necessarily meet our needs, and we're in opposition. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Ryan Sherman on behalf of Los Angeles County Professional Peace Officers Association, the Long Beach and Santa Ana Police Officer Associations, the Sacramento County Deputy Sheriff Association, and the California Fraternal Order of Police. Um, I concur with my colleagues in opposition to the bill. I wanted to point out one other thing. Um, the mandates uh, we have a problem with. The section, second part of the bill talks about uh, a permissive approach and their guidelines. The problem we have with those guidelines is that the legislative intent is declared in section one and the legislative intent said these are all to be followed, this entire section. So with that, we're opposed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, committee. Dave Spiller, police chief with the Pleasanton Police Department. We currently have a very successful body camera program and have for the last four years. Um, as a member of the California Police Chiefs Association, I want to communicate that I'm strongly opposed to this bill as written. Good afternoon, committee. Darrell McAllister, Chief of Police in Union City, California. We've had body cameras deployed for eight years now, and they have been very successful. I am very much in favor of the use of body cameras, but I am very much opposed to this bill as it is written because it is problematic for the reasons that are stated. And if it were to be passed as such, I, as a police chief of my organization that's been using them for eight years, would have to reconsider the deployment of those cameras. All right. Is there anybody else who wishes to be heard, one side or another? Seeing none, let's go to questions. Uh, I'm sorry. We have two people raising their hands in the back. Public comment. Stephen T. Webb, president of the Sacramento branch in AACP. We are for the body cameras and the way that is written now. We need to stop doing this senseless killing. It needs to be photographed. We need to make sure that we get the trust back in the community. So we support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from the panel? Mr. Cooper. Yeah, I, I do. And first of all, thank every, I want to thank everybody for coming here and speaking on this. Um, Oakland's a little bit differently. Oakland's under consent decree right now, so they've got someone else telling them how to run their department in essence. So that doesn't fit most departments. Um, I support body cameras. Um, I'm not here to support the bad actors that have done the things that we've seen on TV. Um, whatever happens, happens with those folks. But a lot of the women, men and women are good in law enforcement. Um, 
I think the devil's in the details getting here, how we're going to do it. I think I would rather use the carrot approach and, and try and bring as many agencies as we can in that want to wear body cameras. Body cameras are a great tool. In-car cameras are a great tool. We've had those around here, a lot of agencies, since uh, the early 2000s. And they've been very effective, and officers are allowed to review those reports. On a homicide investigation, you've got a suspect in the room, you're interviewing them, the camera's rolling. Those detectives go back and review that tape. Um, when I was working patrol, back in the day, I had a micro cassette recorder in my pocket. I recorded conversations. I reviewed that. I used that. So it's always been an effective tool to use it. I think the public wants it. The public sees it on TV because of a lot of video surveillance. So the public, in some of the surveys I've seen, they want video cameras and like them because they think it brings out the facts. Not that, not that any, anybody's doing bad all the time, but they're used to that. The public wants to see that. Um, so it really comes down to the details, you know, how we, um, you know, figure this out. I think also um, turning on and off, and there's some of the issues I have, that really doesn't work because we know domestic violence situations quite often go downhill. If you've got a, both sides in there, you put the cuffs on one, quite often a fight will ensue. If that camera's turned off, you're not going to capture that. Uh, we talked earlier about a, a crash. If you're at a crash scene, maybe someone's uh, driving under the influence, and that camera's not on initially, if something goes down or happens, it's not on videotape. And I, I talked to uh, uh, the representative from Oakland PD the other day, and there are times in emergency situations when you're jumping out of that car, and your first thing you're going to do is draw your weapon. You're not thinking about turning on your portable radio or activating a body camera. That camera's not on all the time. So I know OPD, from what I was told by their representative, there are times when the camera has not been turned on. You know, having been in law enforcement for 30 years, when you're jumping out in a felony vehicle stop or chasing somebody, your first instinct is to get your gun out, bottom line, depending on who you're dealing with, or a taser. So there will be times when that will not be turned on. It's not a perfect system. I think some of the departments have great protocols that are in place right now, um, and one size doesn't fit all. Um, with the big city departments, they have a lot of problems that smaller, jurisdic smaller jurisdictions don't have. So I support it. I want to work with the author and, and make it happen. It's just, I think it's just trying to get, work those details out. And um, I think the public wants it. The public wants transparency. I want transparency. But let's do it right, and let's all work together. And it's something that can happen here. We've heard from our chiefs that represent us. They're in the community. And they know firsthand. And, um, you know, like I said, no one's up here justifying what's happened across the country or here in California. But in the end, we, I think we all want to solve the same problem, and it's a matter of how we get there. And I think working together, um, we can make it stronger. So... You know, um, in, in the way it's, the bill's written right now, I, I can't support it. I'm willing to work with the author to, to help do it. Uh, I think we're, we're close to getting there. It's just working out those few small details. Um, but, uh, you know, body cameras, I support body cameras. But it's just crafting that language that uh, hits that sweet spot. And, and it's really not hiding anything. I think body cameras, in the end, will benefit law enforcement and the public, just like the in-car cameras did. The bad actors are out there. They're still going to do dumb things and they'll be caught on camera. But by far, the mass majority are out there doing their job uh, every day as professionals, both men and women. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Dubovny. Maybe the police chief could step back up from Oakland and the opposition could send someone back up. I, I would say that after hearing from Mr. Cooper, uh, my one concern for the author and for law enforcement, currently it seems like from Mr. Cooper's statement that an officer could review uh, a dashboard cam, could see an ATM camera in the area or any type of security camera from another venue that might be able to provide perspective. I think you also mentioned you could provide other types of digital recordings before they do the report. We kind of heard the reason why we'd want to have that break and, and provide a more, I think the word was used, honest perspective before the reviewing of the body camera. but. In all practical terms, if they can go and look at their dash cam, if they can look at ATM cameras, if they can look at cell phone cameras, if they can look at security cameras, if they can listen to digital recordings, if they can look at tape from interviews uh, with suspects or witnesses and factor all that into their report for a homicide or another type of um, excessive force allegation, why do we draw the line on the body cameras and, and how are we really accomplishing the goal to have that, I guess, clean perspective before the tapes are viewed? And, and I think, you know, if we had the situation where all those things were factored out 
and then you look at the tape and then there could be amendment and of course we're not trying to get a one for one but if all those other things are factoring in why leave out body cameras in that kind of like scenario and and how do we really think we're keeping a clean perspective i'd like to hear both from your point of view and maybe one of the law enforcement groups that were in opposition if that's possible thank you okay so as far as uh, officer access to other evidentiary things uh, for lower level force incidents, we allow officers to access even the body camera footage. It's it's really only in the in the scenario of the of the officer involved shooting, hit or miss, that, that we we draw that that distinction. What we allow them to watch, what we don't. But uh, but, but for but for one of these higher incidents that obviously have greater consequence. Could an officer in your department or in other departments across the state, before they do the report, could they ask to see ATM footage? Could they check the uh, dash cam? Could they look at security footage? Could they look at interview footage? Could they look at other types of evidence before they do the report that while might not be as you know relevant as a body camera image, could still provide outside perspective? I can't speak for the practices of other police departments across the state. As far as Oakland, no. In that scenario, we would not let the officer watch all that, all those various other uh, things. Um, ultimately, at that point, we're conducting a homicide investigation. Now, granted, the, the vast majority of these things uh, were appropriate uses of force by, by the officer, but nevertheless, it is a homicide investigation, um, and we have to give it its due uh, proper attention. But Chief, the vast majority of these cases are not homicide investigations on use of force. I mean, you have a, a finite number of officer-involved shootings per year. So if you look at that, most of them aren't use of force situations. And I guess the, the, where I think it's problematic at, if, you have a, if you're writing two reports, you know, you write one report and then, well, it's a little different, go ahead and write another report. That's problematic, having been in court and, you know, and seeing that and been, grill, been grilled by a defense attorney writing one report. And obviously, as the professor said, you don't remember everything. Right. That's just a human mind. So to me, it's problematic when we're writing two reports. That opens up um, the agency, the jurisdiction, and the officer to liability. So I don't, I, I just, I have a hard time wrapping my arms around that. In, in practice, while we uh, allow the officers the opportunity to provide a second statement, they usually have not. Right. Um, because their, their original statement is, it's pretty close to, to what happened. Uh, so. So going back to those, those officer-involved shootings, those are not the majority of your use of force investigations. No, they're very small. So I, that's, a, that's a small quantity. So most of it, and my <coughs> other question is, when does it trigger it? I mean, maybe you use your baton on somebody, and there, there's no complaint filed with that. Is that investigated, or at what level does a case get investigated if no complaint's filed? So we actually, yes, we do an investigation. Every one of those investigations conducted by a supervisor. Uh, it's, it's not done to the standard that... Um, a officer involved shooting is and when we have an officer involved shooting we have a, a criminal investigation and an administrative investigation for for the uh, lower level uses of force uh, usually you'll have uh, the administrative investigation into the the force but that we don't uh, launch a, a criminal investigation to see if it was uh, appropriate for the officer to hit somebody with a baton that just be a use of force report and just done at the supervisory level or? Uh, in our process, uh, the supervisor comes out, does an investigation that gets reviewed up the chain and ultimately to a force review board. Now, is that part of the consent decree also? Um, some of it is, yes. So that's, I mean, and, and part of that is you guys are being forced to do that because of whatever reasons. I'm not going to go into that. So I think it's a little bit different to use Oakland PD as an example when some of the changes you have were forced out of necessity versus most agencies don't. Well, smaller, I, smaller mid-sized agencies haven't had to deal with that. So, But the idea behind the consent decree is that you're imposing best practices in the industry on, on the police department. So um, it's not like um, if, if it's a best practice and it's been identified across the country by the Department of Justice as a best practice, then that should theoretically be a best practice for any police department. But, but some of the best practices we've seen identified across the country by the Attorney General and by the Cal Chiefs or CPOA um, don't align with that. Yeah, no, clearly this, there's a dispute so, on this topic, yes. So, I'm just, so I would say that more or less what you're doing is in the minority than what the majority identifies as the best practices and principles. That's probably true. Okay, thank you. Answer the question from law enforcement that is opposing this in terms of 
my original intent, and I appreciate that debate because that gave me some clarity, but my original question uh, to the chief from Oakland was, there's all these other available audio and visual recordings, whether it's an ATM, whether it's a public security camera, whether it's a, a camera on a local you know, department store, or especially in this case, a dash camera. Are your members at PORAC or in the Highway Patrol able to view these tapes before they do their reports now, even in when you have a situation where you have, unfortunately, uh, a death or some type of uh, excessive force charge? Are they able to review these now before they're filing their re report? Mr. Chairman, can I you want to go? Yeah, of course. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Yes, before, just so you know, before we even took a position on this bill, or, or body cams in general, we did major research. We had all of our panel attorneys and our board of directors in California, I'm talking about speaking for PORAC right now, because the High Patrol actually did the same thing on theirs, and um, research all of, the, all of the policies right now, currently with body cams and within dash cams and other types of report. We also looked nationally. We looked at all the ones that are available in the state and the federal federal area. Nearly every one of the agencies we looked at allow them to review other types of footage and other types of media prior to writing their report. As did the Attorney General in his report. They did major research before the Attorney General came out with their best practices. So that has been the case. Um, again, I don't know the situation of Oakland because they're under a federal um, consent decree, but I can tell you we have spoken with the Inspector General, the Independent Inspector General of Los Angeles, three times in the last 24 hours. The Inspector General feels very strongly that officers should be able to, for the purposes of accuracy and the accuracy of the judicial system, for even for the, uh, the, uh, the person who may have uh, been arrested in a case, that, that the officers should review all video and all media prior to writing their report. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. This is um, this is a very important bill. We know how um, how timely it is with all the things that uh, we've been seeing, and uh, we've I think most of us have been heartbroken about um, with what we've been seeing in the news media. What I'm going to do is take a five minute recess where we're going to get the opposition and the proponents uh, just in the hallway. Five minute recess, no more. I know members have to catch flights. Uh, this is a very important bill, though. We want to be very thoughtful about this. There's already been a lot of back and forth and some very valid testimony. I want to thank everybody who came here to testify. So we're just going to take a five-minute recess. I'm going to go out in the hallway with the author and the proponents and opponents, and we're going to see if we can strike a compromise. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the privacy issues yet. We will go over the privacy and consumer protection issues as well. But we're going to go in the hallway for five minutes. We'll be right back. Thank you. Members, do not go anywhere.